Um, last week, I had the uh, opportunity to go to camp with my school. It was nothing better to do that I could think of spending 64 days with 65 seventh graders in the woods, six hours away from my family. I just love being there. I can't wait till next year when we have to go again. <laughs> um, but I, I've, I've been favored to not go the first three years. And uh, it was my turn, so I, I had to go, right? And uh, then I, my, I wanted to complain the whole time. So they would say, don't invite Mr. Harrison back again. He just made it miserable for the kids and everybody. Um, and then I was praying mightily that we didn't have to sleep outside. Because I want to take all this stuff I bought back because I don't just have camping stuff in the garage, right? So I have my receipt. I'm getting all this back. And uh, guess what? It started lightning and thundering. Like, man, that's favor, man. I, <laughs> I asked that, and that's what we got. So it started thundering and lightning, and everybody gathered around. I got right in the group. I'm like, no, we can't have the kids out. And it's damaged, you know, these parents, gonna, they're going to be worried. So I was landed on fix, so we got to sleep back in the cabin. It was cool. Then, so I thought I escaped that. We get back to school. We had an outbreak of bed bugs. So everybody's scratching and putting on stuff. You know, I'm like, Lord, please, I, I can't do bed bugs, you know. And so no bed bugs. It's just a favor, just these little things. Then a few weeks ago, like this 800-year storm came in, and everybody was affected, and everybody's watching the water rise, and no water damage. It's just favor. Oftentimes, we just kind of walk through life, and little things happen, or big things happen, and we just think that God is supposed to take care of us, and no harm should come our way ever because we save and speak in tongues and walk on water backwards. But every now and then, God will rescue you. Or save you from a little trouble yeah. that you didn't even see coming around the corner. Don't you appreciate him? I mean, this is this is why the old saints say, "Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord." Anybody got faith in the house? Come on, you can wave your hand a little bit better. You appreciate God for just looking over you, watching over you. You know, we we do God so bad. We ask him for everything and give him a little bit of something. And it's almost an inconvenience to say thank you. It's almost an inconvenience to stand on your feet and, and say out loud, Lord, I appreciate you. I, I, I love you. You know, thank you for, for looking out for me, you know, one more time. And, and, and I didn't deserve it. Okay? But his faithfulness, his grace and his mercy just watches over me every day of my life. And I don't take it for granted. I hope you don't either. Yes. This next song, we all know. We can say it together. Love is patient. Love is kind. Patient care. 
Love is kind. Love is felt most when it's genuine. But I've had, I had my share. Manipulated and his strength was used. But then he gets happy. When I think back about my story, everybody's got a story. And I know you favored me. But could it try it over me? That's why I should keep it. Yes, they tried. But could it try it? Come on, give them a little hand count of praise again. This shouldn't be redundant. And you shouldn't be forced. You really mean that. Come on, stand on your feet. Come on, make up your own words. He's good. Come on, give him another praise. Come on, tell him how much you love him, how much you thank him. Just appreciate it. He's been good. He didn't have to do it, but he did. Come on, he favors you. His hand of protection is on you. He kept it. One more time. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is felt most when it's genuine. share of love abused. Sometimes people take advantage of it. Manipulate it. And it's strength misused. But I can't help to give you glory. Yes, God. When I think about my story, Serve a sovereign God. Yes, they did try. They couldn't try. Yeah, they whispered. Conspired. They told their lies. God favors me. My character. My integrity. My faith in God. He favors me. Won't fall. Won't bend. Won't compromise. God. I speak life and prosperity and I speak help. They whispered. They conspired. Come on, they told some lies on me. But God favors me. My character, integrity, and my strong faith in God. He favors me. Will not fall. Won't be won't compromise. God favors me. And I speak life and prosperity. And I speak health. God favors me. Oh, they whisper. Come on, conspire. They told their lies. God favors me. My character, my integrity, my faith in God. God favors me. Will not fall.
thank you for your time. I recognize that Deshaun Watson is suited up. Uh, many came at 845 because they didn't want to have to make a decision. Amen. Thank you for those who are here uh, at the 11th service. If you're our guest today, just wave your hand. I don't want you to stand. I just want to make sure I see you again. Thank you for worshiping with us today. You didn't have to do that. The Holy Spirit led you to be with us. We want you to know you're a blessing to us as you are a blessing to your family, and we appreciate uh, your being with us. I want to emphasize something in the life of the church. I want to emphasize this prayer conference that's happening on the 14th. We're busy. Uh, many, many things that we will have to do. I am preaching uh, in the Woodlands on that morning at 9 a.m. for the Westland Covenant Association. Uh, but as soon as I finish preaching, I'm going to be on uh, 59, coming back here. Or is it 45? Which other one the Woodlands on? 45. Coming back here uh, to be a part of the prayer conference. I want to lift this up. I don't think there's anyone who would say prayer is not important in the life of the church. I just, everybody thinks prayer is important. But somehow, individually, we don't think it's our role, that it's important to have a prayer minister, it's important to have persons who are praying. I am encouraging you uh, to be a part of this. The, the persons who you see who are the speakers, they're wonderful. Jan Palmore is a powerful preacher, filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with, uh, with, with the Word of God, and just been a blessing for so long. For the brothers who are here, there's, when men pray, there's an opportunity for you to come and and, and be a part of, of a focused effort for men to pray and to pray with power and authority, to pray blessings on your marriage, to pray blessings on your community and on your children. Now, when you go out there, it's going to say $20. They're going to give you breakfast. It's like, if you don't have $20, just show up. Say, Pastor said I could come. All right? And just come on in. We'll take care of the $20. It's more important to us that you be here so that you can grow as a disciple by talking to the Lord than anything else. So want to encourage you, anybody else that you know that you want to be a part of that, we want to encourage you to come. Amen? Saints of God, if you're able, let's stand to read the Word of God together. I invite you to look with me in the Gospel according to St. John. John's Gospel, chapter 14. I am going to begin reading at verse 8 from the New International Version. John's Gospel, chapter 14. If you need a Bible, simply raise your hand. The ushers will provide you a Bible. Amen. That's our gift to you if you uh, need a Bible. If not, you just simply leave it where you are. Please raise your hand if you need a Bible. Amen. Here now in verse 8. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe in the, on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Show me your word. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Lord God, we are your people, and this is your word. Open your word for us that we may hear clearly what the word says to the people who have an ear to hear. Lord, we come weak and weary, worn and tattered. We come with joy and disappointment. We come out of the sunshine and the rain, but we come, Lord. And we come now asking the Holy Spirit to let the word speak to every heart in the place it needs to be spoken to. Shape our hearts that we may be more like you. And Lord, I will be careful, and I pray your people will be careful to give your name, praise, honor, and glory. And the people of God said amen and praise God. Thank you, ushers. I want to remind you, it seems so long ago that we just shared Holy Communion. You remember that, right? 
And there was a prayer at the very beginning of that. I want to read for you again what we share together. It is good to come together in unity, to sing and pray to the one true and living God. Somebody say it's good. We pray today that our hearts might be shaped by the Holy Spirit to love God and our neighbors as ourselves. There is something that rings hollow when we love God but don't love the folk God created. <laughs> you know the folk I'm talking about. They don't never agree with you. Matter of fact, they don't like you. And, and it's hard to even imagine that God created them and loves them as deeply as God loves you. We pray that all bitterness and strife will fade away. We pray that every ounce of bitterness and disenchantment and hurt and anything that separates us from the love of God and the love of our neighbor would fade away. We pray and ask God to forgive us as we forgive others. You know the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, you know, if you, after you say that, if you read just a little further, it says, if you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. So we ought to be in the forgiving business, and we need the, the Holy Ghost to shape our hearts in that way. Lord, help us to pray in a manner that invites the lost to seek Jesus, and the saved to serve like Jesus served. See, just not a random prayer. We want to pray in such a manner that if there's somebody who does not know Jesus, they may be inclined toward Jesus. And then those of us who proclaim that we know Jesus, we might begin to serve like we sing. We, we might begin to serve like we preach. We, we might be begin to serve the way we tell people about our faith. And then it says, we offer our prayers with all your people now and with the multitude that is in heaven, praising your name. The Bible tells us we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And this month, I want to focus on prayer and preach about that. And so if prayer gives you the highs, if prayer makes you feel uneasy, you might want to visit the rest of this month. There's been some churches you've been wanting to check out. This might be the month. Sunday school, prayer. Bible studies, prayer. Children's gatherings, prayer. War room, prayer room. We want to focus on this thing that we take for granted. How many of you remember that old saying that says reading is fundamental? If you read well, it opens up the possibility of doing other things well. If you don't read well, then it limits your horizons. Amen? If you don't pray, you limit your horizon. Because prayer is required by God for us to communicate with God. And I don't, want to, I don't want you to feel any way ashamed of praying. I'm not talking professional praying. I grew up in the Baptist church, and it was a small church, and when I would come to church, the deacons would be in front, and there was church always started with the devotional. Guide me over, thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. Then the old mother would say, I am. Y'all remember that? Then a deacon would read a scripture, another deacon would pray. Then they start singing while the deacon praying. And we weren't paying any attention. At least I wasn't. But prayer is fundamental. It's as if your favorite author, think of your favorite writer. Maybe it's Ralph Ellison or Baldwin or um, Tony Morrison, whoever. Think about your favorite writer. You've read their books and you, you think about what their intent was. What if you got an opportunity to go to them and say, can I talk to you about what you wrote? When I read this, I've read Invisible Man more times than I, and every time I read it, I see something I missed. The first time I read it, I was like, I don't understand this at all. I don't know what, 
all of this stuff is. But every time I read it, I see something. This book is written by the author and finisher of your faith. The only way to find out <laughs> what he means for your life is to talk to him. It's to talk to him. You can hear the preacher preach about it. You can go to Bible study, get information about it. But you have the privilege of going to the author and saying, you, you know, in that John chapter, what did you mean when you said I could ask anything in your name and I get it? Because I've been watching the cable preachers. And they tell me that that means I'm living below God's plan. That if I want a car, all I got to do is describe it to God. Tell him what I want. And come on here, somebody. They're telling me that if I want a house with four or five garages, all I got to do is believe it and tell him and he'll give it because I'm his child. Is that what you really meant for my life? And so we treat God, we treat Jesus, we treat the Bible as a talisman. We treat it like it's a genie's lamp. <laughs> Y'all remember the story of Aladdin, right? You, you rub on it, and then the genie comes out. And the genie looked at whoever rubbed on it and said, you have three wishes. You mean three? Three wishes, I give you whatever. And you know, the first one you just waste because you don't trust the genie. Give me a glass of water. By the time you get to that lamp, you're thinking hard now, huh? We treat God as if God is a cosmic bellhop. I don't care how much you like the song, call him up and tell him what you want. Because you tell him don't mean you get what you want. That's not in the book. That's a song. If you want to know God's plan for your life, you've got to read the book. And here's what you do. He says, if you ask in my name, which means you're asking in my will. You're asking for what I want you to have. And anything I want for you, if you ask me for it, I will give it to you. But you got to pray. Now let me share with you. It's not the deacon's prayer. It's not the preacher's prayer. I grew up with King James praying. There was a lot of whither forth thou art. Nobody else? And so there were so many thous and things. I was like, Good Lord. But I've come to know that the God I serve speaks every language. He, he speaks every language, every idiom, every dialect. Your grammar doesn't have to line up if your heart's right. I wish I had somebody. Your syntax may not be right, but if your spirit is right, then, then you, you can just talk to him. God, Stuff all out of order. Verb, no subject, verb, agreement. You just crying, snotting up. You can't even get it out. And God's still answering your prayer because God knows the depth of your heart. When you pray to God, you are never informing God. You are never letting God own anything. God already knows your need. God already knows your heart. God already knows your brokenness. God already knows your desires. God wants you to humble yourself. So that God can get in your life and guide you in the way that honors God. Prayer is not something we add on at the end. Now, some of y'all know I was out of town last week in a little town in Alabama, so small that I went to the library for internet, and I was doing some work for things I had to do, and I didn't have a, a thumb drive. I went to the counter in a little a library, I asked if they had one, they said no. I said, is there a CVS or a Walgreens? They said no, you'll need to go to Jackson to get one of those. <laughs> Are you praying? And that's, that's small, ain't it? <laughs> Not even a right aid. I drove 83 miles from Mobile. Didn't see a Whataburger nowhere, where am I? <laughs> what kind of civilization is this? <laughs> Not a Whataburger in 83 miles. How am I going to make it, Lord? Are you with me? When you pray, you've got to be serious that God simply wants you to talk to him. You don't have to have fancy words. Simply talk to him. 
You can come to the altar and do that, but you can do it in the aisle at Walmart. You can do it at the Family Dollar. You can do it at Chevron or Shell. You can do it in your place of employment. You, you Come on here, somebody. You can pray no matter where you are. It's simply having a conversation with God the way you talk. You don't have to sound like pastor. You don't have to sound like deacon. You don't have to have it all together. You don't even have to quote some scripture to God. Folks, you need to tell God what he said. God know what he said in his word. You ain't got to tell him. You've got to put the word deep in your heart so that when you need it, it comes up. And so it's important for us to pray here in the 14th chapter of John's gospel. It's a time of great sorrow for the, the disciples who follow Jesus. Jesus is coming to the end of his life. He told them, I'm going to die, and they're not happy with that. And so Jesus says to them at the beginning of the 14th chapter, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Do I have anybody here, your heart has been troubled? Your heart has been broken? God is saying, don't let your heart be troubled. I, I'm with you. I'm for you. Things don't look God, good, but I am here with you. All right. I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to ask the Spirit. Is there anybody here who by prayer God healed your body? If, if, Stand up, Brother James. Just w stand up, Brother James. Can you stand? Here's a brother, and I, I know the story. I, I've been in the hospital. God has healed his body. Now, is there anybody else here that God has healed their body? Just stand wherever you are. Sometimes you got to be aware. Folk don't think God's healing. Folk, folk don't think God is healing. For God healed your body. It wasn't a doctor. Listen, doctors treat, God heals. Hey, doctors diagnose, give prognosis, but only God heals. Wait, wait, just, just stay up, stay up, stay up. Say, how many of you had a struggle in your life? You didn't know how to get out of it. You thought you were in a, in a corral that was no way out, and God made a way for you. Stand up if God made a way for you. All right, wait a minute now. How many of you been double dip broke? You didn't know how the light bill was going to get paid. You, and God made a way for you. How many of you were lost on your way to hell but God? Wait, wait, there's some folk God ain't done nothing for. But the fact that you're here today tells me we still got a prayer. Every now and then, you got a witness. Wait a minute, wait. How many of you love somebody and you've lost them? They've gone to be with the Lord, and yet God has made a way for you. You ought to give God some praise. You ought to give God some praise for what prayer changes things. All right, be seated. Let me, let me, let me preach for seven minutes. We say that our vision and mission is to follow Jesus and do what Jesus did. Jesus prayed. 35 references to Jesus praying in the New Testament. 23 occasions. Jesus prayed about all kinds of stuff. He prayed for you. He, uh, that's John chapter 17, John chapter He was praying for us before we got here. He prayed for the people who were hungry. He looked at them and had compassion on them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. He prayed for his disciples. He prayed for himself. He prayed in every situation, if Jesus prayed, who knew no sin, how is it that I can skip prayer? Because I'm an ordained elder. How is it that you can skip prayer because you were born in the church? My grandmama was in the church. All right, grandmama's prayer won't get you in. You, you've got to be willing to pray to have an ongoing, intimate conversation with God anywhere, at any time, so much so that you begin to know God's voice. So that when God walks in the Garden of Eden in your life, calls Adam and Eve, you say, Lord, here I am. You don't run and hide because you're trying to get away from God. You spend so much time with God. You can't wait to have a conversation with the God who created you in his own image. Prayer 
changes things. Prayer works. Jesus knew that it worked. In John's Gospel, chapter 11, when he goes down to the tomb of Lazarus, who's been in the ground four days with a rock rolled in front of it, folk crying and having a party that's just full of pity, Jesus looked up to heaven and prayed. Then he said, show me where you laid him. See, sometimes the reason you can't get that rock out in front of you, you didn't pray before you start pushing the rock. Sometimes before you, the reason you can't get life, you didn't pray before you opened it up. Sometimes the reason nothing comes out of the dead tomb of your life is you're not praying before you go in. It's important for us to understand how important prayer was to Jesus. He prayed by himself. Then every now and then he say, can y'all pray with me? You know us, we can't stay awake. We're too busy, we got too busy. Can you just watch with me one hour? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says, praying in such agony that the sweat dripped like blood. You know what Gethsemane means? It means the place where the olives are crushed. It's that place that Jesus is being crushed by my sin. My sin is crushing the life out of Jesus. But I got a suspicion that it's not just my sin. I got a suspicion that mingled with my sin is your sin. And because of what we did, he died. He was crushed. He was wounded. I'm preaching right here, preaching. He was wounded for my transgression. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this terrible thing. Nobody else has sinned but mine. And so nobody else can intercede for me. I've got to come to him for myself and say, Lord, have mercy. You ain't never had a have mercy? That's country. I know ham. I didn't say have. I said have mercy. That's how my grandmama prayed. Have mercy, Lord. Have mercy on me, Lord. We so righteous, we come to God and we start off with all of our merit badges. I've been in a church since I was 15. I was in the choir. God doesn't need your merit badges. God needs your heart. Come to God and say, Lord, here I am. All right. Let me not wear y'all out and let you get back in the first quarter. Prayer changes things. All right, I'm going to follow his direction. Listen. <laughs> Let me give you three places where the Bible tells us what prayer will do and how prayer can change your life because you will find yourself in the same type of situation. David, writing in Psalm 51, says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. Blot out my transgressions. Watch me here. How many of y'all know what blotting is? How many of y'all don't know what blotting is? See, preachers be preaching people like, he says something, I don't have a clue. What is Blotting. <laughs> See, raise your hand, you ain't got to be worried about folks. You don't know what blotting is? You leave out it. Listen, blotting means soak it up. Yeah. So when you spill something, you get that napping and you, oh, this good here. Yeah. Hey, when my sin was spilling out, when I couldn't clean myself up, Jesus came down through 42 generations and blotted out my sin. Not just my sin, but your sin. Blot out my sin. Hey, wash me and cleanse me. Make me better than I could ever be on my own. Sometimes you got to go to Psalm 51 and say, Lord, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's my sin. Ain't nobody made me do it. Ain't nobody tricked me. Ain't nobody called me. I wanted it more than I wanted you, so I did it. Lord, blot out my transgressions. Then in 2 Kings chapter 19 and 20, there's a preacher called Hezekiah. Hezekiah got a problem. He's surrounded by his enemies. He done tried everything and everybody to deliver him. And you, 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 you ain't never had no Hezekiah moment. You done tried everybody. You done went through your whole little phone list. They won't tweet you back. They won't snap nor chat with you. They won't periscope with you. They won't tweet Twitter or twat with you. Come, come on here, somebody. <laughs> yeah. Lord knows they won't return your call because they know you want something. Just like you always do when you call. You never call 
unless you want something. Well, we never call God until we want something from him. But I dare you to come to him no matter how many times you tweeted him, no matter how many times you praised him. I dare you to come with a clean heart. God will change your situation, change your circumstance, because he's that. You know how I know? The Bible says God sent the preacher Isaiah to Hezekiah. Go down to Hezekiah, tell Hezekiah, get your house in order. Because today you are going to die. Get your house in order, Hezekiah. You know, the preacher got him a rhema word from the Lord. He go just running up in there. I'm brother, this ain't going to be good news for you, but God told me to tell you. I now declare and decree what God told me to tell you. Today you're going to die. Ain't nothing me, but it's just Jesus telling me to tell you. Now, I know Jesus ain't named in the Old Testament, but Jesus is God. He was there in the beginning. Let us. Come on here, somebody. Are you with me now? The Bible says, that Hezekiah did not cuss, he did not fuss, he turned his face to the wall and, ain't got but three folk reading the Bible, he turned his face to the wall and prayed. And he began to pray to God that God would be merciful and kind to him. And there the preacher is walking out in the courtyard heading home and God say, stop! Turn around, walk right back up the stairs you just came down. Knock on that door and tell Hezekiah, Hezekiah, God has heard your prayer. You ever been down to nothing? You ever been out of every option? You, you're down to nothing. The odds are against you. You're just about to give up. He walked back in and said, God heard your prayers. Not only is God going to give you a tomorrow, but he told me not five years, not 10 years, but he's going to give you 15 more years to praise him, to worship him, to do... Everything God has given you is to give you an opportunity to praise him, to give you an opportunity to worship, not to get what you want in life, not to have it your way, but to have it God's way. And when we have it God's way, then we hear what Jesus said. Whatsoever you want, ask for it in my name, and I will give it to you. Saints of God, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus and you don't have a prayer relationship with Jesus, today is your day. Forget about the preacher. It doesn't matter how short or tall he is. Y'all wake your neighbor up. They'll get that. <laughs> it doesn't matter what shingle. This is about your relationship with Jesus. Are you willing to come to him and say, I love you more than my doubt? I love you more than every heartache I've had. I love you more than any stuff I have. And I've not been serving you with my whole heart. I want to give my life to you again. Maybe for the first time or you want to do it over again. We need you if we're going to be the church you want to be a part of. Everybody's looking for a church. Help the church be what you need. A place where you can have the healing of God in your heart and in your mind. Saints of God, preachers can't do that. Choirs can't do that. Only the Holy Ghost can do that.